So um, welcome to the first in our seminar series on sustainability politics. Um, the background to it is partly simply, very simply, the gravity of the environmental crisis we face and the lack of action being taken by governments and industries, which, which raises questions which we would do well to pursue. Um, along one branch of the crisis, uh, that is that of climate change. And if a single graph could sum up our plight in this respect, it would be the, the, the graph where we see carbon emissions as measured at Mauna Loa plotted against meetings of the COP. So the diplomats meet and they meet again and the emission line rises and it rises sometimes even faster. At each gathering of the COP, the hosts promise that a turning point has been reached. But the words are largely empty. Some are able to hold up statistics demonstrating that their nation has reduced its emissions, but they don't factor in the emissions embodied in imports, for example, which in this country make up around half of the total. So that's part of the background to this seminar series. The other reason for it is that here at Brunel, we have a galaxy of scholars from right across the academic spectrum who are researching aspects of environmental crisis and how to mitigate them. And a forum such as this offers some opportunity to discuss our research across disciplinary boundaries with each other here at Brunel and with outside speakers. Um, with Brunel colleagues in mind, I originally intended this seminar to be simultaneously on campus and online, but that was rather rash, uh, it turns out, as most colleagues, understandably, are finding it more comfortable to take the Zoom option. Um, I'm going to put in the chat box the rest of the seminar schedule, which includes speakers from all sorts of different disciplines. They're, they're united around a concern at the level of environmental crisis, and each one also will have something to say about technology. Now, mentioning technology brings me on to our, our speaker today. I'm extremely pleased that Julian Allwood has been able to spare some time to be with us. Julian is a professor of engineering and the environment at Cambridge. He's the lead author of the Absolute Zero Report, uh, a report that maps out in forensic detail a pathway to decarbonization of the British economy. It's, it weighs up what is feasible within the necessary timeframes. And this report really is the gold standard. It's the key reference for, for discussion on this question. Um, and what gives Julian's research a particular edge, I think, is his experience um, and his knowledge of both sides of technology, so to speak. What I mean is he has a long record of developing technologies that enable, for example, emissions reductions and will be critical to accelerating uh, decarbonization. At the same time though, he takes a very sober approach to one of the central temptations or distractions of climate policy. And here I'm talking of the idea of the technological fix or, or technological fetishism, as I would call it in a broader sense. The, the belief that technologies uh, are, are there, are out there, available as magic bullets that can solve all sorts of problems such that business as usual can continue. All right, um, no further introduction is required, although I will in the chat box um, uh, paste a couple of Julian's publications, including the Absolute Zero report for those of you who are interested. Um, the format of, the, the, of this meeting will be the usual one. Julian will talk for 25 or 30 minutes, uh, and then there's time for questions after that. So over to you, Julian. Great, thank you very much indeed. Gareth, can I just check? You can see the slides and you can hear me. We can. Perfect. Uh, well, I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you all for joining. Um, and I want to talk about the what I think of as the rhetoric action gap, exactly as Gareth has just described in his introduction. It seems to me that we there are um, stages in our journey to actually dealing with climate mitigation. The first one I'll call phony war number one, which was the one uh, dominated by climate skeptics. Uh, the people who wanted, for reasons of entertainment really, to claim that the science uh, was not true. And I feel that that largely was solved 
somewhere between the Nobel Prize winning fourth assessment report of the IPCC in 2007 and the Paris Agreement of 2015. Since then, climate skepticism is limited to a small number of people who are entertainers who get fees out of preparing, presenting a skeptical uh, view and Fox News, who I suppose are also in the entertainment industry. Um, however, since then, we've been in phony war number two, and that is, again, as Gareth just said in the introduction, about techno-optimism. And the rhetoric is here something like, uh, we're going to get to net zero uh, through conventional economic methods. We're going to incentivize uh, innovation, and out of new technologies, we're going to both solve the problem and also make profit, because we'll sell our new technologies to everybody else. Um, and that is very much where we are at the moment. Um, I was amused in Gareth's uh, introduction that he referred to a graph of the COP meetings against uh, emissions because I had prepared exactly that uh, picture to show here. Um, here is the history of emissions since we started talking about them. You can see the problem is now uh, at least 50% worse than it was when we started talking about it in 1990. Um, and here's what John Kerry said. For the second time, the Americans got the idea that climate change was real when Joe Biden was elected. And John Kerry said, uh, I'm genuinely optimistic because I believe in our ingenuity and capacity, blah, blah, blah. 50% of our reductions that we'll make by 2050 will come from technologies that don't yet exist. So technology is going to solve the problem and we're all going to be profitable. Um, it's interesting to compare it with another American with an expensive hairstyle talking in 2007, saying exactly the same thing. So although um, it's great that we now have a democratic government in the US who at least recognize the issue is real, they've learned nothing about actually implementing it. If you look at emissions in the UK, the government likes to use this graph. It's a completely phony uh, statement that the GDP of the UK has grown faster than the G7 countries, while its emissions have dropped faster than anywhere else. Um, is that because of our success in deploying new technologies? Well, if you take the government's data on the breakdown of our emissions over the last uh, 25 years, here's the story. The red line here is the same as the green line on the left there, and that is the 42% cut. Um, the blue line here is if I um, take proper account of what we actually caused by our spending. So a substantial part of our cut is simply from closing industry and uh, importing goods from elsewhere. If it comes from another country, they're foreign, so their emissions can't count, nothing to do with us. Uh, obviously, that's nonsense. We're still causing the emissions. And also, of course, we carefully wrote the Climate Change Act not to have to report international aviation or shipping. So if I add those in, they, I get to the blue line. So the blue line reflects some genuine achievement. We have cut our emissions since 1990, almost entirely due to Mrs. Thatcher's fight with the coal miners, uh, shifting from coal to gas powered electricity. Not remotely a new technology that was familiar from uh, the 1940s that we had gas turbines, um, but that has been by far the biggest contributor to UK mitigation. Uh, we have also improved our landfill management due to the EU's landfill tax regulation uh, and done something with uh, generating wind um, offshore. Uh, this data ends at 2016 and that's expanded. I'll come back to that in a moment. But you can see that underlying our emissions from transport, buildings and farming are essentially unchanged. And uh, the only thing that's happened in industry is closure. If you look out of the window and look at the size of the cars on the roads and the number of them, you can see that we haven't even begun to think about climate mitigation yet. Uh, we're driving cars on average that weigh 12 and a half times more than the people inside them and using them for four hours a week with 1.6 people in on average. So we haven't even begun thinking about real climate mitigation yet and new technology has had no impact whatsoever. That, however, doesn't dampen our corporates. So here are three examples. I just did a random survey while I was preparing the talk. At British Airways, we have a clear roadmap to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050, by offsetting carbon emissions, by making aviation fuel from biomass, and by making hydrogen that will be an alternative fuel. 
Shell is going to become net zero by 2050 by capturing and storing and buying offsets. And meanwhile, ArcelorMittal are going to use hydrogen, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. So hydrogen is a new technology. There is no zero emissions hydrogen production in the UK at all at the moment. Carbon capture and storage is a new technology. There's none currently operating in the UK and offsets will come on to in a moment. So the corporate rhetoric is still very much about the fact that new technologies are going to solve the problem. Business as usual can carry on. It's very much a statement of the second phony war. What about the political rhetoric? Well, this is the allegedly independent climate change committee, the advisory body to the government, uh, and their current so-called balanced pathway to get to net zero. And if you look at the uh, wedges of their reduction path here, you can see that reducing demand and energy efficiency, whatever that means, is a small component. Electrification is substantial. Uh, that's obvious, and we're electrifying cars at a sensible rate at the moment. And everything else is new technologies that don't yet exist, which have somehow expanded in 28 years to cover half of all current emissions. If I summarize the Climate Change Committee's advice, you can see that substitution or demand reduction and efficiency are the small components. The other three are non-emitting electricity, negative emissions, and increased use of biomass. Hydrogen doesn't exist as a native resource, so you either make it from CCS, carbon capture and storage, or non-emitting electricity, and ditto negative emissions. You either power it, or you use it from biomass, or you do carbon capture and storage. Um, that was then translated into the government's 10-point plan in November last year. Here it is. This is the 10-point plan for how we're going to reach net zero based on the advice of the Climate Change Committee. This is now what the government says we're going to do. And if I reorder them, you can see that the story is exactly the same. The resources we're going to draw on are the same, half of which don't uh, exist uh, in effect at the moment. Um, here is, uh, let's just quickly look at the three resources that um, these reports are saying we're going to draw on. This is the UK's energy electricity generation mix over the last uh, 20 years. And you can see that in the last decade, our non-emitting generation has grown at a very nice linear rate. Um, and in proportion, our emitting generation has gone down. Um, and that is a real success in UK policy. It's the expansion of wind and solar. My previous graph ended at 2015, and you can see that the expansion has continued since then, allowing closure in, um, in particularly coal power generation. Um, so with non-emitting electricity, we have done well. However, it's quite difficult to go faster. And the reason is that um, energy, the energy density of renewables, this is what my late colleague David Mackay was very keen on championing, you need to ex deliver them over an enormous area to have a large effect. Um, so David's units were in watts per square meter of land committed to each different source. And these numbers are averaged over the year. Uh, so three watts per square meter for offshore wind, five for solar, that's got a little bit better, it's pro approaching 10 now, and a half of a watt per square meter for biofuel. But on average in the UK, we're using 5,000 watts per person, and we've got 4,000 square meters each. So unless you're generating one and a quarter watts per square meter, you can't solve the problem in the UK. So biomass, or biofuel just can't have a significant effect for us, and solar and offshore wind have to be deployed at gigantic scale, uh, and we're not doing that. Um, so if the government delivers on its plan to quadruple offshore wind, um, over the next decade, it would just about allow this to grow. Interestingly, Hinkley Point C, our new nuclear power station, if it opens on time in 2026, will only just be in time to replace all the nuclear power stations that will close by 2030 because they've reached the end of their life. So there's no very uh, confident story in non-emitting electricity. We're doing okay, but we aren't going to be going faster than this linear trade trend we've seen in the last decade. What about biomass, ca capturing carbon by growing more trees? Well, here is the cycle of emissions capture, um, or this is, sorry, forest carbon storage uh, in tons of CO2 per hectare um, over a long period. And you can see that as a tree grows, then there's a period where nothing happens as the tree is a sapling. 
then it grows and it captures at a rate of around about five tons of carbon per hectare, uh, sorry, tons of CO2 equivalent per hectare during the main growth period. Uh, if you keep the tree there, it eventually stabilizes, or if you harvest it, then there's a loss of carbon from the soil as you do the planting, and then the cycle grows again. So the key about this is that it's slow and it doesn't capture very much carbon per unit of land. If we doubled the entire forestry area of the whole of the UK, uh, we would capture exactly two years of current emissions, but it would take 60 years to have that effect. Um, so growing trees just can't, it's too late for that to have a significant benefit for us. But on top of that, the graph on the right is one that it should be a warning to any mitigation plan based on biomass, um, that uh, human beings are already appropriating nearly 30% of the world's entire harvest, the net primary productivity of all plants on the world. And that's what's creating the crisis of diversity or species loss. Um, and clearly we can't expand that. So using more biomass as part of our uh, climate mitigation uh, strategy cannot be acceptable when you think of the consequences for other uh, species. Um, negative emissions is a marvelous fantasy. Uh, Bill Gates is very keen on this idea. These are fans powered by renewables, which pump the air from the atmosphere, just air, through a chemical process and convert it into liquid CO2, which is then compressed and stored underground. Well, for those of you who remember the second law of thermodynamics, you'll remember that the amount of energy to power this has to be greater than the amount of energy that you gained when you burned the fossil fuel to release the CO2 uh, in the beginning. Um, and therefore, if anybody anywhere in the world is currently generating electricity from fossil fuels, you should not squander any non-emitting electricity to power this uh, process. You should use it to close other fossil power generation. Um, carbon capture and storage, however, has really caught the imagination of the world's politicians. It's a very British approach. There's something that we don't like, so we should sweep it under the carpet. And in fact, in this case, we should compress it uh, and then pump it three kilometers under the carpet. And with this picture, it looks like a very sensible thing to do. Um, here's the idea. You take um, CO2 at uh, atmospheric pressure, compress it. Obviously, that requires energy to do that. Pump it two, to, two and a half to three kilometers under the ground, and it becomes smaller and liquid, and you can put it in the aquifers, which used to contain methane. Um, that has been proven. And here is the pro-CCS lobbies figures on carbon capture and storage. The red is what is actually happening. And if you look at the units here in megatons, then the world's emissions are measured in gigatons. Uh, current anthropogenic or human emissions are about 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. And the total capacity of carbon capture and storage is of the order of 40 megatons, so 0.1% of total emissions. Um, however, the lobby is very enthusiastic, so these blue charts are its reports of uh, everything that it thought was going to be built in the future. And you can see that the projects aren't delivering at anything like the rate that the lobby would like to have. We also don't know how much of the capacity is actually used because the industry doesn't release that figure. But we do know that three quarters of it is used to get more fossil fuels out of the ground. So ironically, the bulk effect of CCS at the moment is to just increase fossil fuel extraction. So it has been proven there is one power station in Saskatchewan, uh, which is one tenth of the size of an average new build gas powered uh, power station in the UK. It's been operating for three or four years, but they've stopped releasing any public numbers about how it's going, presumably because it's not going as well as they would like it to do. So a really good technology to develop, but it should have no place whatsoever in policy because it's far too early in the development stage. Okay, uh, so just to clarify that, here are global emissions caused by humans in brown, and here is the global capacity of CCS in blue. It hasn't left the axis yet. Would you bet your children's future on that? No, definitely not. Finally, at the moment, the word hydrogen has taken on the same meaning as abracadabra, in British politics, uh, you know that when you go to a pantomime in the, uh, in, at Christmas, uh, Aladdin rubs a magic lamp and out comes a genie. 
uh, who says abracadabra and fixes all problems. Hydrogen now has exactly that same meaning. You say hydrogen and it sounds like you've solved the problem. Well, there are three ways of making hydrogen from methane leading to CO2 emissions, and that's the only way operating in the UK at the moment. With carbon capture and storage, because I've just shown there's almost none in the world, or with electrolysis. And we are building a pilot plant in Teesside, or at least we've started the planning permission about doing that to make a tiny amount of it. But let's just uh, think about how much hydrogen you need. One steel company in the world is building a pilot plant for making steel using hydrogen. All the other steel companies are talking about using hydrogen, but this Swedish company is actually doing it. And here are their figures. And their headline statement is, if you want to make steel from hydrogen, you need a lot of fossil free electricity. In fact, you need seven times more electricity to make steel from iron ore uh, using hydrogen than you do to recycle steel in an electric arc furnace. So if I compare the electricity required, for example, for a battery car or a hydrogen car, the inefficiency of hydrogen means that it takes three times more electricity. Six times if I use a hydrogen boiler in my house, seven times for making iron. And that would be fine if we have a massive excess supply of non-emitting electricity, but I've already shown you that we don't. So the current plans are built on pretty shaky foundations. And I want to give that a little bit of structure by asking four key questions about techno-optimism. Firstly, are offsets compatible with net zero targets? Then do the plans add up? Is there time to deploy things? And are we being rational in the way that we're managing risk? So let's look at offsets first. Offsets uh, were largely discredited about 10 years ago and have been quiet until Mark Carney, again with Bill Gates' support, started talking about voluntary carbon markets. This is the idea that uh, you can uh, buy emissions on a so-called voluntary market and your emissions will be cancelled out. We're now committed to net zero by 2050. So that means that if you take an emitting activity, a plane, let's say, and buy an offset, then the offset, it can't just pay back eventually. It must have cancelled out all the emissions by 2050 or otherwise the emissions in 2050 will be higher as a result of your activity. That's not compatible with net zero. So here's a little model. Let's assume that the emissions in red are released here at time zero. And then I pay for an offset, which after some delay for management and uh, installation leads to the project starting. Almost all offsetting projects lead to capital emissions, whether it's planting trees and disrupting the soil or building new equipment. There's usually some capital emissions, at which point removal begins at some rate uh, for a lifespan of the emission. Now, if I play this out for three representative types of, um, of offset, planting trees, replacing an existing blast furnace with gas powered direct reduced iron, or subsidizing the purchase of an electric car. Here's what happens as I try and offset the price of a return flight to, uh, from London to New York each year. Um, the prices currently, I, I looked at the prices during um, the time when you couldn't get into America, so they were very cheap. It was about 330 pounds at that stage. So there's the ticket price. And you could buy so-called offsets for about 40 or 50 pounds. Um, the offsets already all have to be much more expensive and the trees and the subsidizing electric car would have to be significantly more expensive even than the ticket price. But as time goes on, the amount of time left for the offset to capture emissions decreases. So in other words, you've got to deploy them at greater and greater scale as you approach 2050 to the point that in every case, the scale becomes infinite. Um, after about 2030, tree planting is irrelevant because there isn't time for the tree to negate the effect of its own uh, soil and then grow its full canopy of leaves and to sequester emissions equivalent to whatever was uh, the cause of the initial release. Um, so offsetting is almost entirely an illusion. You can see that it is just about possible that some of these offsets could be valid now for a short period but they're vastly more expensive than anybody realizes because they've got to be deployed at much greater scale than anybody realizes. And if you're going to spend that much money on an offset, obviously it's only the rich who can afford to do it. Uh, they're buying medieval indulgences in effect, asking for forgiveness for their 
uh, release of emissions. It would be much better if they use that money to stimulate the market for substitutes, uh, whatever they are, using Zoom rather than flying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So offsets um, essentially are almost uh, no longer possible, and very soon it will be implausible that offsets could be at all relevant. Let's now look at adding up the requirements for resources. Remember that what the Climate Change Committee is requiring is that we do this with non-emitting electricity, negative emissions and biomass. And on the graph on the right, I've shown on the x-axis the demand in 2050 that the Climate Change Committee predicts that we'll have for these three resources. So 100% is what they say we'll need in 2050. You can see that the non-emitting electricity has to grow by a factor of four. And if we carry on on the linear growth path uh, of the last decade, we would manage a factor of three, uh, certainly not by 2035. There's no way, no way we're going to hit that target. Um, but we could get close to this on non-emitting electricity. With biomass, they're expanding our demand for that, and there is no way that we can uh, support that expansion without further uh, attack on species diversity. But look at the negative emissions. There is currently none. And yet the uh, Climate Change Committee is forecasting a massive amount of those by 2050. To my taste, this is utterly irrational. Uh, if you have a technology that hasn't yet operated at any scale, then we should find gain experience of it, but not have it anywhere near our deployment plans. So plans are not adding up very well at the moment, largely at the moment because of the word hydrogen. People forget that hydrogen has to be made, and that requires one of these three resources. What about the speed at which we can bring things about? Here is the timeline of Hinkley Point C. The yellow is the International Energy Agency Authority's project management guidelines for building a new nuclear power station, which would take a mere 12 years. And the purple is the journey to Hinkley Point C, starting from when the government made its outline policy commitment. Um, and you can see that it will take about 22 years if it's on time, but that's obviously very unlikely. Um, we're currently here after about 16 years at the moment. Um, these projects aren't just construction projects. They also require social consent. They require land rights. They require discussion on public finance, uh, environmental concerns, legal concerns. And this is with a technology that's already pretty familiar. Um, here's the same for offshore wind. This is the Hornsey 2 project, which should open this year. Um, again, this one has taken 16 years from commitment to commissioning. Um, and that one is closer to the project management prediction of Deloitte in this case. So the issue is that it takes a long time to bring about large new energy structure, uh, energy infrastructure projects. Um, and we can't avoid that. We're a democracy, so we need to have public discussion on finance and land access and so on. We've done a big study on this in our group, looking at the fastest rates of deployment of new energy technologies, nuclear, wind, CCGT, uh, in different countries. And what the graph shows is that at the origin is the point at which first commercial deployment began. So before the origin is a period of 30 to 100 years uh, during which development occurs. And CCS is still at that scale. We haven't yet got to the first commercial deployment of a full-scale uh, generation plant here. And after then, the growth rate is constrained. Now, this is from the first commercial one, which in France was the early 1950s. And in fact, the progress was unsteady. There was a very sharp rise in the 1980s of the sustained nuclear program. So the French government were able to accelerate, but only after they gained enough experience to be confident that they could do so. So deployment rates are slow for these technologies. And that means we should quite clearly separate the process of gaining experience of absolutely everything and the process of deploying. And right now, because it's so urgent that we act, we should be deploying only things that we already have significant commercial experience. Finally, about risk. Um, the um, graph on the left here is the most frightening graph I have seen. One of my PhD students is just finishing a large project on societal collapse. We think the phrase global warming is unhelpful in the UK because it sounds like we won't need to go on holiday elsewhere. Really what uh, global warming is about is uncontrolled migration. 
as people escape countries who can no longer provide enough food to sustain the population. So using the IPCC's scenarios of temperature and rainfall and the United Nations um, Forestry and Agriculture Office's um, model of crop productivity, my student has forecast the point at which countries will no longer be able to sustain themselves and won't have enough money to buy food from elsewhere. And what scares the bejeevers off me, if that's the right phrase, is that the first collapse in Africa is occurring within the next decade. Um, and you can see a substantial population drop due to starvation driven by climate change. I don't know if we've got this right yet. We're going to pick this over in great detail before we submit it to peer review, before it goes into the public domain. But I know that the story of the graph is correct. That's really what climate change is about, is uncontrolled loss of food and therefore starvation. We aren't acting as if that's true. We're acting as if climate change is a middle-class conversation and a sort of small adjustment to economics. It really isn't. Greta Thunberg is right with her rhetoric about crisis. Um, that is an expression of the crisis that we need to have at the forefront of any discussion. So on the right-hand side is a view of risk in the solution space we're looking at. The techno-optimistic view, as I've said, the air capture, hydrogen steel, CCS, are all extremely risky ideas because we can't deploy enough of them in the amount of time we have left, given the stage of development that we're at now. But we've allowed the politicians to develop a rhetoric as if there was only a binary choice between techno-optimism and behavioral change, where they view behavioral change as the unlikely idea that we all voluntarily wear hair shirts and give up a comfortable lifestyle. What I've called the missing obvious here is using today's technologies differently. There's an absolutely unlimited range of opportunities for us to live within no emissions by living differently using the technologies that we have, rather than by this fantasy that we have to have a completely new but invisible magic energy system. So where we're at is phony war two. It's still going on. And I think what might end it is either the evidence of catastrophe, and I hope we can act before then, or increasingly the possibility that we can get the investors to notice the financial risk of what they're doing. In particular, the pension funds are taking money today off people under the age of 37. And anybody under the age of 37 investing in a pension now is hoping to reap their reward after 2050. Now, if the science is right and 2050 is the critical date, then that means that the way that your pension fund is invested should be focused on companies that survive beyond 2050. So if your pension fund is investing in fossil airlines, in cement, in fossil fuels of any type, then very clearly they aren't going to be able to deliver uh, the pension that you are hoping for as you retire. So I'm hoping that that might be the trigger for reality. The reality is that climate change is a problem of health and safety. It's not at all a problem about economics. Um, just like the pandemic, it's something where we need to act collectively because of its threat to our future. And once we understand that, we'll find that we can live very well, but differently within the constraints imposed by delivering zero emissions. Uh, we won't have as much energy as we used to, but we will still have plenty of energy and so on. So the reality is a different economy. And what we're doing in the UK FIRES programme is trying to give reality to what that is and to stimulate the innovation, the entrepreneurship to bring it about, the people who will profit when that becomes reality, as it certainly must. So I want to use the rest of the talk to talk about uh, what that reality actually embraces. Um, here is global emissions uh, broken down by the devices that cause the emissions. Uh, combustion engines, uh, industrial processes, deforestation, fertilizer, rice, ruminants, and waste decomposition. Um, our commitment to get to net zero by 2050 means closing all of those activities. There are no negative emissions. So net zero doesn't is a meaningless phrase. Zero emissions or absolute zero is what we're about. So if you want to translate that into simple public messages, at home, there are really only four things that matter. Swap the fossil car for an electric car, swap the fossil boiler for an electric heat pump, stop using fossil aeroplanes, and stop eating beef, lamb, and dairy. Those are the big drivers that you control from home. At work, 
The critical thing is to stop building new buildings because the large concrete and steel frame buildings are built to work rather than for homes. Um, we need to buy bulk materials for electric suppliers and swap out all other forms of fossil fuel use. And here are the sorts of things that we need to be saying to the government, expand non-emitting supply, electrify the remaining infrastructure. Only one third of the UK's rail network is electrified at the moment. So the rest won't be used unless we can quickly deploy electrification of the rest, which is a great and immediate opportunity. Um, so in the Absolute Zero report, what we said was assume that all energy is non-emitting electricity and that the rate at which we deploy it matches the rate at which we did it from 2010 to 2020. Currently, we're not quite on course with that trajectory, but we're close to it. No expansion in the use of biomass and no negative emissions technologies. Net zero is equal to absolute zero. And on that basis, we wrote the absolute zero report. Here's the graph of energy. So the history of uh, non-emitting electricity that I showed you before up to now, our projection into the future, Here's the amount of electricity we would need if we electrified everything. Uh, we'll have around about 60%, call it a half of the electricity we'd actually like. And a key part of the report was to prove that we can live perfectly well uh, with half the amount of electricity. For example, if we drove cars that merely weighed six times the weight of the passengers inside them rather than 12, uh, it would be human suffering beyond imagination to drive such small cars, except that that's what we did 30 years ago. Um, but there are four things that we currently have no meaningful solution. Um, those are ruminants, aeroplanes, ships, and cement. Um, the aviation industry is making a load of absolute nonsense announcements about sustainable jet fuel, um, but it requires so much biomass and so much non-emitting electricity that we won't possibly be able to provide it. Ditto shipping, uh, although at least with shipping, we've got the option potentially of batteries and potentially of wind. Cement is probably the hardest of all, that there are currently no uh, substitute materials and no opportunities to make cement with no emissions, a great opportunity for innovation. So comparing uh, our view of the future with the Climate Change Committee's view and the way that the government is framing it, uh, we are saying around about the same amount of non-emitting electricity, but there won't be any negative emissions or expanded biomass. So a much bigger role for efficiency, but I put it in quotes because it's not the engine, it's the size of the car, it's not the boiler in the house, it's the insulation of the house. So it's the system rather than the equipment uh, that matters. Lots more opportunity for substitution and some restraint. There are some activities that just aren't compatible with zero emissions. Um, here is an example or some examples of the sort of policy that would be compatible with that. Uh, we've got the right policy on shifting to electric cars. Surely soon we'll get the same on gas boilers. Gas boilers last an average of 10 to 12 years. So if we um, announce the closure date beyond which you can't buy them, let's say in 2030, uh, then that would accelerate the rapid transition to electric heat pumps. Um, I really like this idea of transforming stamp duty uh, in order to guarantee deep energy retrofits each time a building changes ownership, which on average is every 10 years, you can see how quickly and effectively that would work because it's much easier to do when the building is empty um, and so on. So those are the real policy actions, uh, none of which are on the menu in the COP uh, discussions, but I'm bringing them up at every chance I get with government people. What does a corporate plan look like? Um, IAG are the company that owns British Airways, whose statement I started with, and this is their balance sheet in their current set of public accounts. You can't look at that and think, gosh, I can see that they mean it, that they bought access to the offsets and the biomass that they need to build their zero emissions future. So as an investor, I should be looking at that saying, actually, this is totally unrealistic. This company will not be operating in 2050 because it hasn't invested in the technologies and the resources it needs to deliver zero emissions. Whereas if I had a balance sheet like this, if I've got my numbers about right, then this would uh, convince me as an investor that IAG were on a course to zero emissions. So they, as a complete uh, company, they buy 10 million tons of uh, kerosene for fueling airplanes per year. And I think I've got this right, that would require 500,000 hectares of arable land and 100 gigawatts of wind turbines. Um, and I've got rough estimates of the investment cost of that. 
So this balance sheet says, okay, I believe IAG will get to zero emissions. So one of the things we've been working on is to say, obviously it's unlikely that IAG are going to become farmers or wind turbine operators. Is there a new financial instrument that we could create that would allow them to pre-purchase access to these resources to convince investors that they were on track? So we are just about, um, I hope very soon in The Economist, there'll be an article about this proposal for ZERPAs, Zero Emissions Resource Procurement Agreements. The three zero emissions resources are the ones I've mentioned, non-emitting electricity, biomass and negative emissions technologies, and procurement agreements are agreements to have access to it in the future, contracts shared between the user and the producer, with the effect that the users can confirm the credibility of their plan and it will stimulate growth in supply from producers. So that's a proposal that we are busily working on and promoting at the moment. What about business as a whole? Some of the sectors clearly have to close. Uh, we can't muck around pretending that the oil industry is going to carry on. The big six oil companies last year invested 5% of their capital expenditure on renewables. 95% was on getting more oil out of the ground. They haven't got it at all. They're not even trying to get to zero emissions. They have to shut. So do all existing cement kills, blast furnaces, ruminant farms, and so on. There's no getting away from that, but there's an equivalent number of sectors that must grow in compensation. So for example, everything about electricity supply and distribution is going to grow. Electric material production is a massive growth opportunity. Electric chemical and plastic production is possible. It's not happening at the moment because they're co-products of oil cracking, but we could develop those processes, plant-based diets, electric transport, and so on. So we know that there's huge growth and we know that there's closure. But on top of that, there's a raft of innovation revealed once you accept that our future is one when we have less energy. And we've been working hard on that this year. Here's the story of the report again, another report we've got coming out in the next week or two. Emissions have to go from wherever they are now to zero by 2050. And we, our only alternative will be electrification with non-emitting electricity, which will cover about half of our needs. So what's going to fill the rest of the gap? And the point we've been making is that there is an enormous range of business innovation, entrepreneurship opportunities here. And you can see the themes, whether it's information, consultancy services, new services that reflect zero emissions like Zoom and so on, delivering education and training, finding new economies of scale and installing electrical infrastructure. So if we have to retrofit two thirds of the UK's rail network in the next 20 years, and um, then somebody's going to work out how to do that much cheaper than we do it at the moment. And they're going to make a lot of money out of doing it, delivering energy efficiency. So efficient, cost-effective retrofits. Uh, the IKEA of building retrofits is going to make an enormous amount of money and so on. I'll circulate the report through Gareth when that one comes out. And we've got, a, I think, 140 new opportunities for entrepreneurship that are revealed only once you realize that magic beans fertilized by unicorn's blood, the new energy technologies that dominate political discussion aren't going to deliver. So there's my summary. We're in Fernie War II at the moment, but it's not gonna work. There is not time to solve climate change with new energy infrastructure technologies. Very specific aspects of our lifestyle will have to change, but it isn't misery. We can have good lives in zero emissions, but they won't be revealed unless we embrace the first point and set in place the policy and innovation opportunities compatible with energy shortage, which is where we're going. Um, there's a problem with the investment community and maybe the Zerpas can help with that. And there is a huge scene of entrepreneurial opportunity that we're now trying to stimulate people uh, to embrace and get going in developing these certainly profitable uh, opportunities. There, thanks very much, let's have a discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. This was a very sobering um, 30 minutes. Um, very informative as well, thanks. I'll, I'll just um, kick off with a question and then turn it over to the rest of you in the, in the audience. Um, so I think it's very helpful the way you um, delineate two different phony wars over climate. One of them we've largely won uh, which is that anthropogenic climate change exists, is meaningful, and is very worrying indeed. 
And the second one we're in the midst of, which is um, which concerns the, our uh, the, the the techniques and technologies for getting emissions down to zero by 2050. And um, there is just as much fantasy on the other side in both debates. But the first debate fairly quickly revealed itself to be based on really utterly irrational and unscientific uh, assumptions. In this second debate, each individual agent of that debate, each, each person or corporation or government that is purveying these fantasy figures, you know, John Kerry's belief uh, that, that, you know, the technologies will arrive even though they don't exist at present. Um, they can all point to actual technologies that have actually been tested and could potentially, if, enorm if ramped up incredibly quickly with all planning regulations swept aside with, and, and so on. So there's a potential rational substrata to the assumptions within that debate, which makes it trickier for those of us who disagree with them to deal with. How do you, what are your reflections on this problem? How can we engage this in this debate? I mean, obviously you're doing this all the time and very effectively, but perhaps um, from your experience in this, I wonder if you have any um, reflections or tips on this question. It's a great question, Gareth. I think you've really nailed something important there. And I don't have a, a completely clear uh, answer. I think um, the analogy with a moonshot or an Apollo program is completely unrealistic because we're not trying to do something once. Uh, we're not trying to put one person on the moon. We're trying to put everybody on the moon. So the problem is not innovation, it's scale. And I think that's the one that we have to find a better way of communicating uh, the rate at which people are scaling things up. Um, specifically in the UK at the moment, we're very much helped by the fact that, to my complete astonishment, uh, the current government announced two intermediate targets on the way to 2050. So we are now committed to 100% cut in emissions by 2050, but we are also committed relative to 2019 to cut them by 45% in 2030 and by 62% in 2035. Now, given the timelines of the nuclear and wind farm projects I showed, it's very obvious, even to a conservative politician, that we can't build any new nuclear power stations before 2030. So that 45% cut actually really means 45% austerity, um, unless so the, there will be a small increase in our total electricity available if we don't cut the gas power and we just add the additional uh, wind that's coming on stream. But that will uh, maybe allow us to get to about 10% of the 45%. The rest has to come from using less energy. Um, and so I'm working on the media presentation of that story because it comes over as being so unpalatable uh, that whoever I was talking to, whatever journalist or member of the public would say, we can't do that. And I can happily now say, well, it's not my idea that you should, it's what the government has committed to. So if you don't like the way I've done it, how are they going to do? They'll have to take more from a different sector and less from the one that you care about most. Um, so I don't know the answer, but I think what we've got to do is to move the debate away from innovation towards scale. Um, that seems to me to be what's really missing. Thanks. Jonathan, uh, your hand is up. Yeah, my question regarding emissions was, uh, obviously NFTs have emerged um, uh, in the last two years. We've seen like how popular they've gotten. And there's a growing concern with emissions regarding NFTs. And obviously, since it's a part of crypto, it's unregulated. People are creating emissions every single day. So is there a plan from either the private sector or the government to look into this uh, field of emissions and like how could this be curbed? I, I didn't know the acronym NFT. What does that mean, Jonathan? It, it's, it, mean, it stands for non-fungible token. So essentially it's, uh, okay, a great way to explain it with an example would be, suppose I create a piece of art and I send it to you digitally and you own it digitally, but technically you don't own it. You own a hashed version of it. 
and uh, people use it uh, as a form of crypto right now right now it's being used as a form of crypto although its major use would be authentication of physical items uh, but the way that it's being used anybody can create an nft on the blockchain and uh, you know sell their own items so it could be like you selling a photograph or something and uh, the major cause for this is emissions because it's on the ethereum blockchain and obviously we know that ethereum uses a lot of gas and power and uh, that already causes a lot of emissions and with nfts it's already increasing so is there a plan to look into that to curb it or something i'm not quite sure i'm understanding are you saying that computing causes a lot of emissions in this case it would be computing but it's not general computing your question relates to bitcoin as well presumably uh, it's not bitcoin per se but uh, nfts have been seen as a much bigger source because a lot of bitcoin even though there's mining a lot of the general population is still involved in trading of bitcoin as compared to nfts where there are literally kids online making an nft and just putting it online and selling it to people i'm really sorry i don't understand your question okay um in this case, I would rather classify that uh, it is computing emission then, um, because pe most people don't see computing emissions as like at the same level as petrol emissions or something. But uh, they're not the not by a million miles. That is a hoax portrayed by bad journalists. The International Energy Agency produces an excellent report every year on the use of electricity in the whole of the world's computing and internet infrastructure. And it's absolutely steady at 1% of electricity use. And the reason is that each time the amount of computing power expands, the efficiency related to Moore's law and the chips getting more uh, dense uh, expands at the same rate. Um, so I'm afraid that is a non-story which gets perpetuated uh, by journalists. We're trying to work out how we can sort that out um, because uh, even the Royal Society wrote a whole report on the emissions of computing. And when I read it, I discovered that the only reference they used was one written by two uh, people working for an electronics company in Sweden in a non-peer reviewed journal. Uh, so computing does not have a big emissions footprint. Thanks. Um, Sangi, your hand is up. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation, it was quite informative if a bit depressing. <laughs> uh, I'm talking from India right now. Uh, so I had a couple of questions. So my first question uh, was about uh, the two phony wars that you mentioned. Uh, so I currently work in uh, public understanding of science, particularly of uh, awareness about the climate crisis. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, the second phony word that you are referring to, the uh, way that uh, techno-optimism is sold as a solution. I'm wondering how much of it is a result of the first phony word that people are still not really, uh, have not grasped uh, the severity of the climate crisis. And among the general public, there is still a feeling that this is not a crisis. Uh, my second question would be about uh, uh, non-emitting uh, electro electrical production. Uh, so, uh, because if uh, expansion of electrical and electronic uh, sectors, uh, because of the material requirements of, uh, say, electronic cars or uh, the storage of uh, lithium batteries or any all, all the mining and stuff, how uh, uh, how non-emitting would they be uh, in net uh, uh, terms? Uh, so those were my two questions. Thank you. They're really great questions. Thank you. Um, I think you've got a very good point, actually, in the first one, that it may well be that that is why the second phony war is going on, is that the first one has not been solved to the point of urgency. I think to the point of kind of intellectual belief, it's true. But I think you're right that people don't see it yet as a crisis. Um, and I think that is a major problem in the public communication of science is to get away from graphs of emissions and temperature into social impacts that people care about. Um, I think this, the, the one that my student is working on of collapse due to starvation is one. Um, another one which I hesitate because it sounds like there's a danger it could be involved in a kind of racist message about migration. Um, but I think that 
people are afraid of migration. Um, obviously in India, one of the first major impacts will be when the population of Bangladesh moves, um, because that's the first major country that will be moved by sea level rise. Um, so I think there's a great job for us all to do in humanizing, converting the, the real problem into language that people can understand. Um, the question of the materials production required to produce electric infrastructure is a really good one. Um, all of the car companies have now woken up to that. They've all accepted that they are making electric cars. And so they are all starting to get concerned about how they're going to be able to access their resources. Um, there is a company, I think, called Polestar, who have made a car with zero emissions. I hope I've got the right reference there. Um, and people will start to think about that very seriously over the next five years. Um, the lithium question is difficult because there's both a political question and a physical one about the, the supply. At the moment, the constraint on lithium supply looks to be more political than geological. Um, but that may, uh, I don't know about the emissions of lithium extraction. Thanks very much. Um, Sangeet, I don't think we've met, but um, I'd be very interested if you're able to stay on at the end of this seminar to ask you how the debate is um, taking place at the moment in India on climate questions, because last time I was in India, there was very low levels of public awareness and public debate on this question, even though India, as we've just been hearing and as we're all aware, will face some of the most extreme uh, problems in terms of Collapse due to starvation, et cetera, et cetera. So that contradiction, I, I, if you're able to uh, hang around uh, for a final five minutes, I would be very uh, appreciative. Um, Constantine, your hand is up. Hello, can you hear? You're, you're muted, Constantine. Constantine, can you hear? Sorry, hi, hi, Constantine here. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I was just fumbling with the technology a bit. Um, thank thank you very much for for an interesting presentation. Um, as I, ju I just wanted to ask um, uh, two questions really. First question is um, with the, with this new bright um, uh, you know carbon zero emitting uh, future you uh, and, and with a more and more reliance as as you predict on. Uh, uh, power and solar generation. Did you actually account for the, for, for the necessity to balance the demand? I mean, how do you actually foresee doing that? I mean, building super peakers? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. To me, it's a secondary question to the first one, which is about how much supply we'll really have. Um, but we have started looking at that uh, only within the UK. Um, and if we take uh, last year's data on wind and solar generation plus nuclear plus anything we imported from French nuclear, so that's our total non-emitting supply, and then scale it up as if that became the whole national supply of electricity, and compare it to the demand for electricity once we've ele electrified all of our devices, what we find is that the supply is roughly constant over the year, but with high variation within the week. Um, but the demand grows massively in the winter due to space heating. So the primary problem with storage is the summer to winter problem. And our numbers suggest that we would need something like a megawatt hour of battery storage per person. And you can buy a megawatt hour battery from China uh, and it's the size of a shipping container. So every house in the UK would need one shipping container's worth of battery per person in order to make that work, which I think is not going to happen. So our conclusion from that is that the solution to the interseasonal storage problem is all about retrofitting buildings so that we don't get that surge in demand in the winter. Um, within the week, I think we've got a lot more options because then we can look at demand shifting, uh, various forms of smaller scale storage, um, and indeed timing the charging, for example, of electric vehicles to points when the wind is blowing. So roughly an electric car will need to be charged once a week 
if it's used in a similar way to cars today, uh, but it doesn't matter too much when that charging occurs. Uh, so I think the day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week problem is probably, there are lots of options for getting there, but the interseasonal one, I think the only option is to reduce the demand in winter. I'm, I'm actually not quite sure about that. I'm, I, I would be more concerned about the actually daily surges in demand because uh, be, because of the nature of the of the uh, re, uh, renewable generation and being highly volatile, so you probably will will have to have a lot of batteries if you rely on batteries, and uh, that is a inefficient way of storing electric electricity and b it's quite dangerous as well. I mean they tend to burn and pretty badly, and you cannot really um, you can really put them down when they when they burn, so it's, it's just just a question. I'm just kind of kind of kind of interested about that. And the second one, because you're looking at Britain as a kind of spherical horse in a vacuum. I mean, it's a separate uh, um, grid, separate system. But if you move a little bit further down on the continent, Europe, which which is a fairly advanced uh, grid system, you know, energy system. But still has a few pools. I mean, for for the for the area that small, I mean, is 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 it? Uh, well, I would say if you really want to save on carbon, etc., you should actually synchronize, at least continentally. You know, even in excluding further east, but you know, uh, come connect in the Swiss system to uh, uh, UCPT and to North Pole. I mean, there's no real reason why these three systems have, uh, work separately. You know, I cannot actually just just by the way of balancing um, the existing supply, you already can save quite a bit. I mean, have, and probably not as much, um, or actually connecting a Brit, uh, a British system to to the European and synchronizing it with that. Um, the investment would probably be significant. I mean, who is going to pay for that? The um, saving a bit is now irrelevant. We have 28 years to get to zero emissions. Uh, and that means we haven't got time to go through a lot of intermediate stages. We need to plan now a 28 year, year journey that actually gets to zero emissions. So I think I would read what you said as being the only energy supply will be electricity, non-emitting electricity, and we can get more service out of it the more interconnections we have in the grid without any question, um, particularly to help with load balancing. So I completely agree that that's a good thing to be doing and will add value. Um, but I think I would start from the other direction of starting from the, es the essential requirement to get to zero emissions. Um, the cost of it, I think, will look different once the public is really frightened. The government spent 32 billion pounds on track and trace software uh, last year. Um, which nobody in advance would have believed that they could possibly have done it. And they must have been ripped off left, right and centre in spending that amount of money on it. Um, but our ability to pay for things changes depending on how frightened we are. Uh, and that is going to change radically. That's, that's very true, to be honest. But um, yeah, so I mean, you're looking at significant decrease in the quality of life uh, in the short term. And, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a big outlay for, uh, for, from the household, which, which would be a very hard thing to sell politically. Well, I, I'm unsure. What is the loss of quality of life that you're referring to? Well, for, first of all, I'm saying that uh, people will have to, uh, to start living a bit more efficiently. I mean, we, we stood, uh, you mentioned we, we should stop building. Uh, first of all, the British way of life of living in their own separate houses is probably going to go and people will start living in flats because okay? it is far more efficient way of actually, you know, distributing heat and delivering electricity and, you know, just more energy efficient. Um, and it's, it's, it will be quite a big strike on the, on the population's, uh, you know, kind of perception of quality of life. I don't recognize that from the talk I've just given. I don't see where the major loss of quality of life is. Mm. Um, I, I would just perceive that, uh, uh, you know, uh, replacing uh, gas boilers for uh, stop building, uh, re being generally consuming significantly less energy would uh, probably uh, a require quite big, quite big outlays from um, from the household themselves, not just from government, 
and also will uh, will require change in in living habits. Okay, but you're saying that in the abstract, whereas I gave a talk where I was specific about what the changes were, and the changes are very specific and not to me the end of life. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Nice. Thanks very much. Um, any okay. final questions before we thank our speaker and um, and disperse? There's uh, any final hands to go up? Okay. Uh, in a minute, I do. I do want to uh, press Sangi to um, uh, give to share any ideas on the situation with it in India with us, uh, if you could. But um, uh, if Julian, if you have to depart meantime, um, thank you very much for speaking and launching the seminar series. I've put um, the UK fires. FIRES, their absolute zero report into the chat. Um, this is Julian's research group, which is currently working on uh, new reports, which will be uh, published shortly. So do keep your eye out for those. And if you would like to get hold of them, uh, you can contact me, I'll, I'll, I'll have them too. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and thanks to those who attended. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you, everybody. Angi, um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could um, share any uh, views from India with us. Uh, what, what is the debate there looking like these days? Um, so to be uh, um, reductive a bit, but still, uh, the overall view would be that there is no significant debate about it, at least in the political uh, sphere. Or in the commercial, like uh, industry, either uh, the more significant uh, steps that are being taken are mostly relabeling of uh, policies, in which are uh, uh, initiative to. It is mostly uh, bureaucratic uh, diversion of uh, attention from one sector to another, and so on. So in in those aspects. It is, it is quite a bleak picture uh, from where I'm looking. Uh, especially in terms of industry, uh, there is no concentrated uh, industrial policy that is uh, uh, aiming to uh, promote more sustainable industry or stuff like that. So uh, as far as I can tell, uh, uh, environmental or uh, climate change related policy has more, uh, been approached more as an international relations uh, subject than as a uh, uh, technological or scientific problem is one of the main features of government policy that I'm observing from where I'm sitting. So, yes, <laughs> sorry okay. for the oblique. Thank, thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah.